I guess it's official, eh? All right. That's good. Thank you for your presence and heartfelt greetings and support um, as Keystone College welcomes, as you heard, a new class who have already accepted our invitation to carry our legacy forward. And uh, those of you in the incoming class, uh, you should know we don't do this every year. <laughs> I know also that many of you just came for the free lunch, and that's okay too. Uh, there's plenty of food after this. Keystone, yes you did, I heard you talking. Yes. <laughs> she said, no we didn't. <laughs> uh, as you've heard, uh, Keystone has been a part of a community with a rich history and increasingly vibrant presence. And I felt welcomed here for the moments the moving trucks pulled up to 29 College Avenue uh, in one of the Victorians where I live with my family. Um, that was last June. Of course, the, the logical question when it comes to today might be, uh, what were they waiting for? <laughs> for this inauguration. Perhaps the search committee uh, spoke to some of my family and friends and colleagues who warned them not to rush into things. <laughs> Whatever the reason, I'm grateful for um, their show of love and support today, especially those of you who came from uh, Sacred Heart University and Fordham University, where I shared a number of years of my life. Uh, in particular, I would like to thank my wife Delia and our two sons, Aiden and Thomas, for the perspective, joy, and relentless hope they bring to my life. Uh, we came to this job together, so it's not a one-person job, and Thomas is already like going like this. So thank you to Delia and Thomas and Aiden. You can get a little embarrassed, that's all right. That's all right. Um, their presence here reminds us of the connections and the ties that we all share as family and community. Um, and as was mentioned earlier, I'm also truly honored to be joined today by my predecessor, uh, Dr. Edward Beam, Ned. Uh, anything that we are able to accomplish in the coming years will be built on the dedicated contributions that you Ned. and your wife, Regina, have made to this fine college. So thank you for your service, and thank you for being here today and for being a true gentleman and a model of how to gracefully pass the torch. Uh, I hope I can be so graceful when the time comes. And uh, welcome also and a heartfelt thanks to the many delegates from colleges and universities across Pennsylvania, New England, and the nation. They're listed in the convocation program, as well as those who extended greetings to us, which are on display in the uh, student center. And I'd especially like to thank the, uh, the college presidents from the area. Um, they were saying, okay, are you sure about this? Uh, this is, and I said, I'm ready. And also, um, Dr. Don Francis, who's the president of the Association of Independent Colleges um, and Universities in Pennsylvania. Your presence honors Keystone and me, and we appreciate your solidarity and support at this moment of meeting for the college, and it attests to our shared mission. Thank you. Thank you as well, trustees, former trustees, alumni, those of you present here and those of you participating at a distance through the miracle of online streaming. It's a, it's a wonderful thing. You deserve this, you serve rather and support the college in so many ways and so you deserve my deep gratitude. And finally, uh, thank you students, faculty and staff who are the heart and soul of this campus communities. Uh, I give special thanks to the many individuals who have worked months planning these events and wrestling with every detail so that we would all feel welcomed and important. And you are important. Uh, Keystone has not hosted an inauguration in 27 years. So it took uh, two pages of people in the program, and they're listening in the program, to, uh, to plan this extraordinary event and to make it such a stunning success. So would you uh, please join me in thanking the uh, inauguration planning committee. So as small children, we, uh, we simply trusted and accepted the other or those who provided for us. But in time, we began to guess who they were, 
what the names of the people and things around us were called. Perhaps as you grew in age, you heard some of the same questions that I did for my mother and father. Your mother is here, by the way. Thank you uh, for coming from Florida. Um, some questions such as this. We will make you stand up, don't worry about it. Uh, such as this, did you wash your hands? Did you brush your teeth? Did you do your homework? Or later as a teenager, what were you thinking? <laughs> Where is your head? Or what are you waiting for? This process of questioning is, is told well in the classic story in, uh, in the scrolls found in Genesis where two of the characters, maybe you recall, are in the Garden of Eden, and they disobey God's instructions not to eat of the fruit from the, tr the, the tree in the middle of the garden. And as most children will do, they question, and they test their limits, and they ate it anyway, and it says their eyes were opened, right? And thus began their adolescence to adult journey of maturity, consciousness, choices, and responsibility. But, uh, but the story continues with God walking in the garden like Bigfoot, you know, boom, 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 limbs. God asks one of the most unlikely questions. God says, where are you? I wonder think that God would know such things. And uh, when children hear this story, they believe they can hide, as if the game of hide and seek is one of God's, you know, favorite games. But the deepest questions have a way of kind of coming around in life and adults probably hear the question a bit differently. Where are you now that you have made all of your decisions and choices and that have brought you to this place? And because of those decisions, where are you going? Quo You know, questions point to a culture's values and meanings. Here are a few questions asked in popular culture in the songs of the past 50 years. I apologize if, if one of these songs stays with you the rest of the day. It's not my intention. But some simple questions. What would you do if I sang out of tune? Would you stand up and walk out on me? I hope so. Uh, does anybody really know what time it is? Where have all the flowers gone? Will you still need me? Will you still feed me when I'm 64? Do you know the way to San Jose? What's going on? Should I stay or should I go? Why can't we be friends? Do you want to know a secret? Who are you? Who, who? <laughs> what are you going to do with all that junk, all that junk inside your trunk? <laughs> or simply Annie Lennox's, why? There's some probing questions, too. Maybe you remember some of these. What's it all about, Alfie? One, two, three. What are we fighting for? Is there anybody out there? What are we waiting for? How will I know? What's so funny about peace, love, and understanding? What's the matter you? Hey, shut up in your face. <laughs> and for the dog lovers, how much is that doggy in the window? Aware, aware, has my little dog gone? And you know, who let the dogs out? <laughs> And many questions deal with love and relationships. Tell me who, ba -do -ba -do, ba -do -ba -do, who wrote the book of love, something like that. Or why do birds suddenly appear every time you are near? Have I told you lately that I love you? Is this love? How can you mend a broken heart? How long has this been going on? How am I supposed to live without you? Will you still love me tomorrow? Who's your daddy? <laughs> or what's love got to do with it? Right? And then finally, there are a few perplexing questions as I was thinking this through. Hello, I love you, won't you tell me your name? <laughs> Where have you gone, Joe DiMaggio? Or from the Beatles' White Album, Why Don't We Do It In The Road? You don't need a college degree, by the way, to answer that question. <laughs> Three words. Tractor, trailer, trucks. <laughs> so although 
although I hear them now in the room, although not, not quite the same as being hit by a truck, um, it is uh, an overwhelming privilege and humbling trust to walk in the leadership and history of an academic institution such as Keystone College. And it's a formidable task to ask the right questions that help to guide the way into the predictably unpredictable future. Um, I believe that one proving question is always more valuable than dozens of easy, shallow answers. And the best way for us to carry our legacy forward, our legacy of excellence forward, is to engage the present questions confidently, confide, with confidence, with faith, and make progress through persistent efforts. That's our motto, right? Via Fitvio. Via progress through efforts towards the cultivation of life giving habits of the mind and heart. That's right, mind and heart. Maybe from the iconic, maybe you remember from the iconic uh, film The Wizard of Oz, there are many questions about mind and heart and the courage to use them both in action. My favorite is Dorothy asks, How do you know if you don't have a brain? And the scarecrow responds, I don't know. But some people without brains do an awful lot of talking, don't they? <laughs> no further comments necessary. <laughs> but both the mind and heart comprise our consciences, and the heart is like a compass. It's our inner pointer to love and truth. And Keystone's legacy of excellence is one of students and teachers asking and acting on good questions. And the questions cannot be rushed. The late Michael Crichton, perhaps some of you remember him, was a uh, Harvard medical graduate, but he became an American best-selling author and producer of science fiction, uh, medical fiction thrillers, uh, wrote pieces such as The Andromeda Strain, Congo Sphere, Jurassic Park. He reportedly said, I am certain there is too much certainty in the world. And good teachers know that if there's too much certainty, then we haven't asked the right questions. We haven't brought out the best in our students. And no, we know that understanding takes time. Good teachers do not denigrate reflection as uncertainty, nor is discernment misunderstood as indecision. And civility is not misconstrued as weakness. In fact, one of the greatest gifts I believe that we can teach in a world that is fascinated with fast talk, simplistic slogans, and false dualisms is bold, thoughtful, and proportionate restraint. In classical language, this was known as the virtue of temperance, born of prudence for the sake of justice and love. In other words, just because we can do something doesn't mean we should. This is at the center of the pursuit of a meaningful and ethical life the heart of a liberal arts and sciences edu education. The seven sources of ethical decision making, who, what, why, when, where, by what means, and how. Impressive, huh? These are the necessary questions, who, what, why, when, where, by what means, and how, for discerning the greatest good, the summum bonum. And as President Beam alluded to earlier, 146 years ago, Charles Reynolds Stephen Capwell and James Freer met in Mr. Freer's general merchandise store down here in Factoryville, and they lamented the lack of a proper preparatory school for young people seeking a college education. And they asked the right question. They said, now that the Civil War is over, what does this community need? And what are we waiting for? Why not start a school? <laughs> and they did. And for those of you interested, the cost, including term bills, books, room, board, fuel, and light, was between $138 and $175 a year, depending on the cost of coal. <laughs> General rules, by the way, if you're still interested, so far you're with me, that's good. And I'm waiting for someone to go like this, so I move on. But general rules include that the term bill be paid in advance. Nice, Kevin, you like that? Okay. Kevin's the CFO here, by the way. Okay, Kevin Wilson. Uh, any room damage was the responsibility of the students. Some things never change. Um, but students, this may catch your attention. Uh, every student was to rise at 6 a.m. and retire with sounding of a bell at 10 p.m. 
and students were forbidden to engage in any amusement or, or diversion during school or study hours, and loud talking was discouraged. <clears throat> Lady students were forbidden to accept the company of any young gentleman as an escort to or from any place in the evening, and gentlemen students were forbidden to carry concealed weapons, <laughs> to use or have in their possession any pistol or other firearm within the limits of the academy grounds. Thank God, right? <laughs> These were rugged times, indeed. <laughs> But the faculty and administration has served here with distinction in these past three centuries, the 1800s, 1900s, and, and the new millennium. And I wonder how they formulated their questions and solutions with each new challenge and to the political and moral life that we experience as individuals and as a nation. Who could have guessed the long-term effects of industrialization or World War I or the Great Depression in the 1930s and World War II were more recently, in the 1960s, as the civil rights movement seemed to test our nation's core, cities burned and campuses were divided over the Vietnam War, our college faculty and leaders answered this question and these questions of their day by expanding, by inviting more students, doubling the size of Capwell Science Hall, building a new library and classroom, a learning center, studios for the fine arts, counseling services, and a a child care center. And similarly, just 30 years ago, who would have guessed that the powerful reshaping of communication, commerce, and education about to be caused by the internet? And who on September 10th, 2001, would have anticipated that our sense of security and perception of the world would be radically changed? The ensuing questions, why did they attack us? Who were they? What were they thinking? And what are we waiting for that plunged us into years of U.S. wars in the Middle East? The times and people change, but from our very beginning, Keystone College has been dedicated to engaging these important questions. While our hearts remain as compasses that point to civility, commitment towards students, and integrity in all our deans, dealings, and some of these vital questions are shared by many others across millennia in a great conversation, and they signal, I believe, a direction for us as we carry Keystone's legacy forward. What does it mean to be a free human being living in community? What does it mean to live a life of dignity, meaning, and purpose? How do we understand and act as responsible stewards of the natural world? And how do we work peacefully to achieve a more just society? Big questions. We won't solve them today. They've been going on for hundreds and thousands of years. And admittedly, there's a growing opinion that college may not be worth the price or the time spent. And the only good colleges are those with the largest endowments and winning athletic teams. Of course, we all appreciate winning teams and large endowments, which is where you come in. Please take out your checkbooks and open. Sorry, I began the uh, default presidential speech to alumni there for a second. Okay. Although uh, the cost of a college education is, is being debated, surely we do not think we can simply shut down colleges and outsource the work of professionals and industrious students, uh, citizens rather. We cannot productively exist as a nation or a state without teachers or engineers, scientists, doctors, medical professionals, attorneys, attorneys, accountants, <laughs> architects, the military, the clergy, and engineering. No more than we can do without carpenters, electricians, masons, painters, plumbers, especially plumbers. And we know that there is a huge difference between passing a driver's test and becoming a beloved school bus driver for generations of children. We know that a house is not necessarily a home. A job is not the same as a career or a profession where one develops, improves, masters, and passes on his or her wisdom, skills, and craft over a lifetime. And employment or occupation is not the same as living a fulfilled life. What do we do when we go home? or are alone? How do we find peace in the midst of loss or misfortune, disappointment, confusion? 
How do we act virtuously in the face of temptation? And where do we learn the choices and contexts of communities that give us the freedom to be here today to make meaning out of love and birth, sickness, transition, sacrifice, forgiveness, commitment, trust, death, and hope? Today's entering class, you will likely hold 10 to 12 different jobs by the time you're 40. So how do we properly prepare you for such a future, for careers that do not yet exist? We believe it's by helping you engage the important questions together, because they keep us all alive and fresh and clear about our vital mission. College is an adventure, a rigorous hike, a laboratory, a rehearsal space, a study, a studio, a learning space, if you will, and a practice gym. It's all of us. College is a community of people committed to creative and critical problem solving. And in the process, we often begin to, an uh, we often begin to answer certain questions, such as, who am I? Who are you? How can we make a difference? So, where are you today? And how well are we positioned for the future? Some of the most exciting questions and challenges are occurring at the heart of scholarship and the creation of knowledge in our very day. For example, the, the gathering, transmitting, and storing of information artifacts is what we do as human beings. But add the internet and affordable access to the internet into the mix, and more than 2 billion people are now connected online. The BBC estimates that a blog is created every second. The Library of Congress hosts billions of pages. YouTube has made the music of the world acceptable, accessible to us all. Not acceptable. <laughs> accessible to us all. And the, uh, the Google Arts project connects the works of more than 7,200 and something artists with our personal machines. Where did we do our research before Yahoo asked Bing and Google? The latter of which estimates more than 31 billion searches per month. And what therefore is a library in our time? And what does it mean to be well read? when three to four thousand books or e-books are published every day. What is an educated person? And how can we understand so much of the world and yet fail to understand ourselves? This increasing dissemination of communication and information will not diminish. In fact, it is exponentially increasing every two to three years. The write me, call me, email me, text me, tweet me, tag me, friend me, Skype me, like me, selfie revolution of communication is here to stay. And thanks to backup systems and the cloud, all of these communications are never completely deleted, which by the way should remind us all to take care of our e-reputations. Who ever heard of such a thing? These technical developments and technological offerings give students at Keystone College access to the same resources as the wealthiest colleges in the world. And by sharing our mission and distinctiveness on the global stage of the internet and social media, we're able to ask, what do you think of us? And by our virtual engagement, we have reimagined an answer to an important perennial question, who is my neighbor? So in short, Keystone College is a community where learning is fostered and flourishes and each student gets a chance to succeed. And the faculty and staff here I am happy to discover and all of the august institutions represented here, we are all committed to transforming students to reach their highest potential. And learning flourishes where freedom, curiosity, and questions abound. And we, when we get it right, our graduates go forth and positively contribute to the world and find success in their personal lives and dream of and work towards the possibility of a deeper truth, a wider context, a more peaceful coexistence, regardless of the obstacles, challenges, and doubts. 
So to quote a, uh, the Austrian poet and novelist Rainer Maria Rilke, who wrote in 1903 to a, a young poet, he said, and the point is to live everything, live the questions now, perhaps, they, perhaps then, someday far in the future, you will gradually, without even noticing it, live your way into the answer. So, where are we? You've heard some of the 146 year history we stand on and what we stand for. You understand our challenge a little better now to educate new generations of students seeking to navigate the storm surges of ever-changing information and reformation of academic fields and disciplines while upholding our standards of rigor and excellence. And so this leads me to ask, can one person really make a difference? What are you waiting for? Let your heart be your compass, live the questions now, and you will never be alone in pursuing your dreams. Thank you. Wednesday and they engage in our orientation that's called Compass. And that's your cue. 